Snowball Spark. You want good words? Data languages. Talk real sports with a real man. Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And now, here's the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of high school, college, and pro sports. Aaron Skinny Calc with the Skinny on Sports. We're talking about practice, man. I'm the MVP. And a good Thursday morning out there, Western Oklahoma. Welcome to the Skinny on Sports right here on 98.1 FM, the Sports Animal. Glad to have you along for the next hour. Last segment of the show, we'll get into the OK Kids State Softball Tournaments, Regional Baseball Tournaments, all getting started today. Tons of local youngsters playing all across the state of Oklahoma uh, in search of state titles. So we'll go through what's going on. There's stuff going on right here at the five, uh, five Plex on the baseball side, Clinton, Weatherford, everywhere. So uh, lots of things getting started today as far as those state softball and baseball tournaments. Talk about that. Uh, tonight is the NBA draft. We've had a couple of trades. Another one last night. Uh, an interesting development uh, for a team that won the title just a couple of years ago. What does it mean? And in a bigger picture sense, what does it mean? And then the Thunder draft. I've got an over-under set on where they'll actually pick. Should fans start getting themselves mentally prepared to go, who? And then what would you do tonight? What do you think they'll do? And then if they happen to draft that number 12, who could that be? Uh, and then we, we – didn't get to it yesterday. We're going to do it today. The arms race in college football, has it been kind of shifted to the back burner or will it be shifted to the back burner? For years now, that's what we've heard about is facilities, facilities, facilities. But with the birth of the NIL, with it appearing as if that's moving more toward the schools or athletic departments than maybe what it originally started as, how does this all going to work? And will we just be back where we started eventually. And then also ESPN has a ranking the next three years, top 25. Interesting to look at that as they try to kind of project with some recruiting classes that signed with some that are committed and what have you and who's on campus and how young they are, that kind of thing. So we'll look at that as well right here off the top of the show. 225-9698 is the phone or the text line. That is 225-9698. Give us a call, shoot us a text. We can talk about any of those things or whatever else might be on your mind, feel free to chime right in at 225-9698. If you're going to be outside the listening area, a couple ways to stay in touch with us. You can log on to kadsam.com. You can download the app. It's got it all, man. Radio, Penny News. Go pick up a free copy of the brand new Penny News, fresh off the press at your favorite lo local newsstands. You can watch Big Elk and Paragon TV during the high school seasons there as well. And then Skinny on Sports Podcast, we tape the show, put it out there each and every day, literally anywhere you can find uh, your favorite podcasts. Good morning, Jared. Good morning. We're both kind of suited up. Yeah, we are ready to go. Now, are you going to Clinton? My assignment is Clinton today. You're, you're Clinton today. Mm -hmm. So the younger daughter, so James is in Clinton, Katie's in Weatherford. In Weatherford. Yeah, I'm helping out a lot with the 8U girls because our man Jeremy is he he floats over to ten you when they are at the same time, so yeah, we forgot to tell him happy birthday yesterday. Uh, yeah, he got a nice serenade of the <laughs> happy birthday song from the girls last night after batting practice. Yeah, happy birthday to Jeremy. But um, yeah, that's where I'll be over at Clinton. Be at Clinton. Yep, should be a fun day. Glad Two. looking to weather doesn't look incredibly hot. Yeah, two games no matter what. Uh, if they win the first, they'll play two. If they lose, so, then they're done today. And we'll then go back to probably a Friday. marathon tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll get to all that uh, yeah. coming up at the end of the show. Okay, so we, I kind of started mentioning this at the end of the show yesterday. For for years, you know what what was one of the things that, um, what was piggybacked on Bob Stoops' early success at Oklahoma, at the turn of the at the turn of the century. And it was facilities, facilities, facilities. Just look at that stadium. The difference in what it was when Bob got here to what it is right now and the vast amounts of money that had been spent not only on the stadium itself, but
but also the different football operations, the facilities, from weight room to training room to all of that, those things. It's been an arms race in college football for the better part of the last three decades. With the birth of NIL and the way that it feels to me like this thing is, is trending. You know, it started out, oh, schools can have nothing to do with these collectives. Nothing. It's, it's kind of it's, it's out away. Yeah. And it's held at arm's length. It does seem like right now with some different uh, states, this one right here in particular, is that starting to move back toward the school and the school not only have the influence but really kind of having uh, the going to have to set up the, the structure of it and, and it goes through there. Do you think that, that this means a shift and maybe that arms race is is over because there there ha- to me there has to be kind of a limit. There's only a certain pool of money that can go toward both of these things. I think it 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 means the arms race is stalled because uh, I think we're still in this trying to figure out uh, era of the NIL. I think it in over time it's going to become more regulated, and I think. Um, once it's more regulated where uh, you know, there's more of a balance to it, then you're going to see more of a balance go back towards paying attention to facilities. So I don't, I don't think it's the, it, the era is over and, and it just stops. I mean, there's, all, there's constantly going to be small improvements. You know, I mean, just what last week we just saw major donation to, uh, or this last weekend from the T Boone Pickens foundation to OSU and am I wrong that some of it go to a, a player development facility? Yeah, there was a facility. Something? There was also, uh, you know, scholarships. Sure. Oh, yeah. What you does know, that mean? We, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So, I don't – again, I don't think it's stopped. I think it's just stalled because we're, we're still figuring out NIL. I know it's, what, three, four years into it. I think we're still figuring it out. And then there's been some cries even from some – pretty big players in college football that say we need to regulate this we need to take a look at this and a step back and and all this stuff and uh i think that's coming in the near future and then once all that balances out i I think we'll uh we'll we'll start seeing some more bigger better things facility wise yeah it just it seems like right now with with the uncertainty but kind of reading the tea leaves of where this thing might be headed it's hard for me to imagine an athletic department slash university, unless it's earmarked, you know, the way that maybe that donation was in, cer- in certain capacity. It's hard for me to imagine, you know, firing out 175 to 200 million on just upgrades to a building that's all- already awesome or to replace a building that's already awesome mm-hmm. when that money can now go straight into the pocket of the players because. At the end of the day, as 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 nice as that stuff has been, and as you know, first rate all across the country. If you ask a kid, would you rather have that or twenty five k? We all know what the answer is going to be. Of course, as short sighted as that might seem, we all know that's where it's going. So if you're a school, then in the respect, you know, I'm thinking football right off the top, but. If you're a school that then gets that reputation of not supporting the players the way others are because you're building them something that you feel is in their best interest but they don't, then how in the world are you going to get guys on campus? You know, it feels like your your player pool to recruit from goes way way down. And I think when we get to that balance, when we get to that regulated NIL era, and like I said, I think the arms race will continue. That's what I think schools are ultimately looking for is saying, we can tell a kid or recruit, we can get you this much money in your pocket, we can get you this, min- this many endorsement deals, and oh, by the way, check out this fine new nutrition center we got or this fine new recovery room with a spa and movie chairs and all, you know what I mean? The best, The best of both worlds. Yeah, and the I, bigger schools are going to be able to have that, I think. But I think eventually, here's what to me, eventually what's going to happen when you talk about getting the the regulation and, and that all put in place and being able to tell somebody what it is and this and that. 
to me, th- that means there's going to be like a set pay scale. Yeah. Yeah. To and, a, a, and Almost like a salary cap. Of course. And, and you're going to see there's – what I'm afraid is that we've had precedent set in the in the in the law, and that we're going to see some uh, some suits come down and say, "No, no, no, you can't cap this." Well, because you know, I, it, it's going to be a mess. I, no, they, I think it can be capped at at a university. That doesn't mean that's all they can make. Period. Uh, okay. I, I just you mean, mean what the university can give them. And they go, okay, now I, you can go out and get your own. That's what I your think. own deals. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Yeah, almost, yeah. almost akin to you know a salary from a team. Yeah, and then you're able to go out and get endorsements on your own. Did you see the? Um, you know, we a, a couple of years ago there was announced that the NCAA football is coming back. EA Sports yeah. is bringing it back. Now have you seen that's that looks like that might be done. That might not be happening. Yeah, because the players the players want money. They want a lot of more money from it and. And it's stalled again. Very similar to why it even ended in the first place. Yeah, because that was, I mean, way back when, that's kind of the the birth of all of this happening was the suit from Mo Bannon's. And that's been forever ago that then ended up into the the name, image, likeness, and mm-hmm. it filtered into the college football game of EA Sports. And and yeah, it it just seems like. Man, if I'm one of those guys, it's you're not going to get rich off of that football. You're they're no, they're not going to pay impossible. you. It's, it's impossible. So just take your 500 bucks and you'll be yeah. immortalized because you're going to be in that game forever. Or, or if I am EA Sports, I'm just making deals with the colleges to get the rights to build their stadiums in their game. And don't worry and, about and, the players. And the, and, and the conferences to use their logos mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And don't worry about the players because you know what? Some fat guy in his mom's basement is going to sit down and make every single player image and likeness and everything – and leak it onto the internet yeah. if someone can download it. It's probably true too. So now with the with the eventual what it, what it feels like an inevitability of the colleges and the athletic departments ending up back in control of this I, in 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 a certain way, maybe not the entirety of NIL, but at least some of it. So where do we really get? What, what, say that again. Where what did we, where did we we're just right back where we were with. It feeling like the universities and the athletic departments end up back with all the power, with you know rules and regulations put forth. Well, I mean, listen, we're talking about you know how the 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 line has blurred between amateur athletes in college and pro in the NFL, right? I mean, that's all kind of blurred. Well, in the pros, you have a commissioner and you you have a boss to answer to in your franchise and all that stuff. Plus, you get your NIL or I say NIL, your endorsement deals and contracts and all that. Why is this any different? Yeah, I, you know, as far as who has the power, just kind of instead of a, a a a franchise owner, you have an athletic director or a president. Well, I, I think eventually the, this is all headed toward. I knew that was coming on the text line. Football being different. Football is football is going to be separate from basketball, everything yeah, else. Everything else, yeah. I, I think that that's just where this is headed, and it all it all is going to have to work together some way because it's under the umbrella of the university of whatever. But I think you're going to like. I think that you said the right word, commissioner. But not not necessarily commissioners of conferences. I think you're going to have to have one overall czar of college of football. College football, and then from there, working with the conferences to make the rules, you know, and how everything works. And, and the NCAA essentially is out of of college football forever. Is I think where this is going to head. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a fascinating time we're living in in the era of college football. And it's kind of scary, too, because with what we loved about college football, that's kind of getting blurred, too. And we love the amateurism of it. We love the the uh, the passionate fan bases, the the traditions and all that. And, you know, that's kind of – you got guys who are – I mean, shoot, you got guys who are going to schools between their start of their career and end, they could be at three, maybe four schools. Depends on who can pay them the most. And that's where the sad part comes in. Like, man, what happened to just going to school because you want to go there? You want to wear that logo. 
on your helmet. So that, so again, it, it again kind of exciting, but I'm anxious to, and maybe I'm just wishful thinking when I say it out loud, but I'm anxious to get to that regulated period of the NIL so we can kind of get back to the focus of, of college football as a whole. But I don't know if we'll ever get there. You know, it's just a different time. We're 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 fast forwarding through. Or we are hurling towards a different era of college football. Well, I I think what we're learning is that as much as we wanted to believe that a lot of these guys were playing for that logo on the helmet and on the front instead of the back, they just simply didn't have the choice to do anything other than that. And now that they do, you're seeing. That it's still uh, for uh, it was more about the the athlete themselves than it ever was about the school, and that's a hard pill for fans to swallow, in co- because that's what that's what you love about it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is rooting yeah. for your school and for your team, with the understanding that the players on the field are going to change every year, if not for sure every four years. Yeah, that's the hard thing to get your head around. Yeah, and it's just not that way. And it, that's what like, I've been trying to personally like. Okay, I, you know, it, it's not a secret we root for OU. And I've kind of told myself, you know, and we've talked about it when it comes to signing day. Like, well, don't, why are we getting incredibly excited about these kids? You know, it, it might help us in the immediate, but they might be gone right after one season. So I've told myself, root for the school. You know, let's just root for your school and let the kids go where they want to go. Hopefully, you get something because the transfer giveth and the transfer can take it away. And, and it does, but I think, see, I'm the exact opposite as almost, of almost everybody on this subject because. People think that the portal is more important than signing day. I think that is so false because, to me, if you do your due diligence on signing day, you don't need the portal nearly to the level as certain as others. Mm-hmm. And if you, it, you know what I'm saying, sure. and that's where I think it needs to be. Uh, for me, that's where the focus would need to be. It's still on signing day, with the portal basically being what junior college has been in the past. If 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 you know yeah. a class here or a class there doesn't work out at a certain position, okay, now we need to go snag somebody for the immediate future while trying to rebuild that depth through the high school recruiting. Uh, speaking of that, ESPN came out with their college football future power rankings, and it's basically uh, just the next three years this year through twenty twenty five, putting together a top twenty five. looking back at this a year ago there has been one team that has plummeted in these rankings and there's been one team that has shot way up in these rankings can you guess the team that plummeted Oklahoma no way worse than that oh you went from like seven to five, seven to twelve. There was a team that was in the top five a year ago that's not even in the top 25 right now. Clemson? Nope. Wow, we could do this all day. It's way it's, – it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a fun answer if you'll just think of it. Think dairy products and fake soldiers. A&M? Texas A&M. A year ago was number four in because, these rankings. Because of that massive class they signed. And now they have fallen completely out of the top 25. Man. Now there's another what one that wasn't even there. Gut punch. That wasn't even in the top 25 that now finds themselves inside the top 20. Solely on last season, in my opinion. Tennessee. Mm-mm. Think a way better team than Tennessee last year, at least where they ended up. TCU? TCU. TCU finds themselves number 17 after not being ranked a year ago. Um, Do you take any of this with a grain of salt because of what we just talked about with the portal and everything? Kind of. I mean, I mean, just yesterday there's a really recruit, big recruiting news that oh, you might have got a really big running back. Is that a, does that take into an account there? You know what I mean? I don't think it does it, yet. It, it just. It's so fluid. It changes daily. The recruiting news and commitments and decommitments and portals. It just it's a daily thing. I think this has a lot more to do with 
the the strength of classes some from say like 2022 2023 maybe what's what's uh, mm-hmm. being or maybe as far back as 21 and quarterback i think quarterback recruiting or what you've got on campus and how long it's going to be there is a huge part of this any guesses on who number one is Oh, gee, Alabama or Georgia? <laughs> Georgia. It's always been Alabama, but Alabama fell to number two. <gasps> Their demise starts. Number three. I actually looked at this before we went on air, but I can't remember. Uh, number three. It's not Alabama or Georgia because they're one and two. Yeah. Or two and one. Who's the other um, Clemson? No, nope. it's Ohio State. The Ohio State. The three monsters of recruiting. Now, number four is an interesting one to me. Because I don't think that the future would have been this bright a year ago. But it's hard to disagree, and when you see what they're doing on the recruiting trail right now. Help me out. Michigan. Oh, okay. Michigan at number four. LSU at five. USC at six. Clemson, seven. Penn State, eight. Tennessee, nine. Florida State, number ten. Oregon, then Oklahoma is 12th. Utah, Notre Dame, 14. Then Texas is found at number 15. Mm. Interesting. Any other, just finish out the to- top 25. Top 25. Any, uh, any um, we're still technically in the Big 12 yeah. as OU fans. Any other Big 12 teams? Sure. Uh, Washington, 16. TCU, 17. Kansas State, 18. Wisconsin, 19. Iowa, 20. Oregon State, 21, South Carolina, 22, UCLA, 23, Pitt, 24, and Ole Miss, 25. So you don't find – I mean, There's, uh, you don't find OSU. Tech? No Texas Tech You don't there? find Tech. Man, I felt like they had a brighter future in the next three years. And you don't find a bunch of those schools. Have, but their recruiting has never been amazing, but they, they it looks like they got a good coach. That could turn around. Yeah, and you think that that would – he ought to, he ought to be able with his ties. Mm-hmm. So Oklahoma at twelve. Let me ask you this: Do you think this this ranking falling to where it did has more to do with six and seven from a year ago, or has more to do with what's coming starting in twenty twenty four with the change of conference? Uh, a little bit of both. I think that if they had had a winning record and more success last year, they'd probably be top ten. It's like, hey, look at that. Brent Venables came in. They they expected to have a step back. But, hey, they got a winning record. But it, it, it was what it was. And then, yeah, I mean, looking ahead to the SEC, and it's probably a big reason why Texas is right there at, what, 15? Same thing we said about them, too, moving into the transition into the really, really tough conference. And assuming that list was made after the SEC schedule reveal for 24, I think I think a lot of that a lot of that take took weight into the decision to put him there. Yeah, I, I would almost think because. But you mentioned quarterback and Texas and OU are pretty solid at future quarterback. We think Manning at Texas and Arnold at OU, and yeah. you'd think you know next three years. This year, the the future quarterback rankings for Texas is seventh, for Oklahoma it's third. That's kind of shocking to me. So, uh, neither team is – well, actually, Texas future defense is 17 no, OU's not. Well, but that's it does, not shocking. Well, no, it's not. But it does – it actually does mention when you read the blurb about how there there seems to be already a shift. And it's – and obviously this would happen when you go from Lincoln Riley to Brent Venables. You, you see an obvious shift already in the – signing class just even from 2023 oh, hard focus on defense a lot more yeah. on defense and but so to this point the offensive recruiting hasn't fallen off the cliff the way the defensive recruiting did under riley mm-hmm. yeah still point. got arnold so mentioned the running back uh tatum uh, what's his last name or well, that was his last name yeah taylor tatum taylor about. yeah yeah I don't know if that's a hundred percent, but everyone's saying it's about ninety nine percent done. Yeah, he hasn't announced anything. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still a good focus there on on the offense. We'll see. 
We'll see how long but it lasts. I meant, Venables, I mean, that's why they hired Venables. I think they realize this is a guy that can build an SEC defense, and I think that's where it has to start if you're going to go into the SEC. Yeah, we'll just we'll, we'll see. We'll see if it ends up being the inverse of what we saw for the previous few years, eventually here at Oklahoma. But I thought those were in some interesting rankings to have. Yeah. You know, I, I really thought we might see one or two more of the Big 12 teams in there just because of the perceived strength of the conference weakening by losing the last two kind of stalwarts of the original Big 12. It is Christmas Day in the NBA. The draft coming. You know, if you're San Antonio, you're kind of like the kid that spotted either the list that your parents had made out <laughs> or actually found where they were hiding your presence with knowing who they're going to draft first with Victor Wimbanyama and with the prize that everyone appears to believe that he is maybe it's just like you you found the car in the garage that you were going to get as a 16 year old and your parents didn't hide it very well but uh outside of that everybody else is kind of in that wait and see kind of in really intriguing and, and exciting mode here to, to find out where and who you end up getting uh, before, but heck before we get even get to that, there's already been a couple of trades, Bradley Beal uh, earlier this week, going out to Phoenix. Then last night, Boston making a move. Uh, they will get Chris Porzingis poor Zingas from Washington. You had a feeling this was coming from the wizards. After Beal was shipped out, this is going to be a total and complete breakdown to the studs and try to rebuild. I don't understand why they didn't do it last year. Maybe they couldn't get it done. But why Why in the world wouldn't you do this a year ago to have the opportunity to tank all year to get what the franchise cornerstone that everybody believes Wimbanyama is? I don't. It seems like a year late <laughs> for the Wizards. But anyway... They trade uh, Christoph Porzingis to Boston. Boston also receives two first-round picks from Memphis. This year's, which is number 25 tonight, and the next year's, it's it came to Memphis courtesy of Golden State, and it's top four protected. So it still could be a pretty good you know, mid to late first-rounder coming from there. Uh, Washington gets Tyus Jones, Danilo Gallinari, and also Mike Muscala. And then Memphis receives Marcus Smart. On the Memphis side, is that Ja Morant insurance? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my what the first thought that came to my mind was this is to hold them over until the suspension is up. Uh, then the second thought came was holy moly the dynamics between John Moran and Marcus Smart on one team that could be explosive if it doesn't work yeah right I, it, what but, has Marcus Smart done in Boston we all remember what he did at Oklahoma State sure but what has he done in Boston to you know what I'm saying it just feels like all he's done has been one of those hard-nosed defensive players that, that is true you know that is, that, yeah that has gotten a little, a little emotional. We've seen that too oh, at sure. times. A little emotional, but that that comes with the nature of the game. I think you see that in a lot of people. But this, yeah, you always go back to the kicking incident at Oklahoma State and in the whatever. crowd and all that. Yeah, but um, I think it's a good get for Memphis. I, I mean, Marcus Smart, I think, is very a very good player that's still in his prime. This feels like a to me for Memphis on it on that side it feels like going back to where they were. You know, the, those playoff battles with Oklahoma City. Oh, yeah. The Tony Allens and uh, Zebo and that group. The, this feels like maybe trying to return to that a little bit more. You've already got, when you can play, you've got Steven Adams that will help with that toughness. You know, uh, and, and uh, Jaron Jackson, a lot of people thought, uh, as good a defensive player as there is in the league. This just kind of supplements on top of that, and plus, if John Morant does something more, something else stupid, Mark Smart's pretty good. Now he's not John Morant, but he's a pretty decent replacement if you just catching one on the fly. Right. How does this work for Boston? How, how does Porzingis fit? 
it, it sure seems like this is a Al Horford replacement. Yeah. Because Al's getting so old, but they're t- completely different di- different types of players. First off, I thought of Porzingis was this was the guy that was supposed to be the superstar in New York, and it never panned out. And usually, when that happens, you'll see guys just kind of go away. You never hear from him again. Yeah, I give him credit; he's stayed in the league longer than I thought he would after it didn't work in New York. So he's become a, a, a nice player that that I guess you'd be okay having on your team. But as far as how it fits in, it does feel like a Horford replacement uh, for Boston. And as long as Boston and their fans, who are crazy at times, understand this is not this guy that the Knicks thought they were going to get. You got, you're got you getting a guy that can be a really good role player on this team. I don't know his stat. Do you have his stats in front of you? Yeah, I do. What do you think he's averaged for a career? Points, rebounds, and assists. Points. Um, don't laugh at me because I'm just draw. I'm just yeah. Going. I'll say twelve, five, and ten. Yeah, almost uh, ten. What? Oh, five assists, ten rebounds. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, okay. I did that backwards. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I was just I was going across here. Uh, yeah, not even close. What is it? 28 and 2. Really? Yeah. See, here's that's production. Here, that's production. Oh, listen, the thing about the Knicks deal was about the time he started to really take off, they traded him to Dallas. He's a better player than people realize. In my opinion. His win shares are 35. I mean, he's a he affects it, but here's the deal. Does he affect it the way Boston needs him to affect? He, he affects it more on offense and defense. And that's why it's kind of a weird replacement for Horford. And, and the, you know, uh, the injury in, in when he tore his ACL in, in New York played a big part of maybe him kind of getting shipped to Dallas. But the, his last full season in New York, he averaged 22 points, blocked three shots, Grabbed seven rebounds a game while shooting 40% from three. That's a hell of a player at seven foot three or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He was really kind of coming on and then he got hurt and then that was kind of the that was the end of it. Uh, but he's you no know, over the previous one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, he's averaged at least twenty. So I I can't wait to see how this works out. If it's kind of a switch in in philosophy, but I, but I will say this: for Boston, I, it, I guess it just depends on how much you value Marcus Smart. Because when you look at Marcus Smart's career in Boston, he ends up the f- fourth all time in steals in that franchise, behind only Paul Pierce, Larry Bird, and Rajon Rondo. I think most people would say he, the only reason that Paul Pierce and Larry Bird had more steals than Marcus Smart because they were there longer. I don't think anyone thinks they're a better defender than Marcus Smart. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And Rondo, you can make that case. And and he definitely became a better player as he was there. But if you're Boston, or if, I, if I'm Boston, and i got to give up Muscala and Marcus Smart to get Kristaps Porzingis and two first-rounders, I do that every single day that ends in Y. Every day. You do. Absolutely. Because we've kind of seen what this team with Marcus Smart is. And it's a fantastic team, but it's got flaws. And I think those flaws are only going to get accentuated if you run back Al Horford for another year or two at his advanced age. Whereas maybe this kind of propels you. You don't need to go very far. You know, you're almost at the top of the mountain. Can Porzingis be that difference? It's kind of eh, scooches you just over the top. I also think that anything anybody wondering about a Jalen Brown move, this probably takes that off the table. Yeah. On for the Celtics, you see what happened in in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, yes, someone went to uh, declared Chris Middleton. Middleton. Chris Middleton declined his forty million dollar player option. To become a, a free agent. Is this a good or bad sign for the Bucks? 
I'd say it's concerning because he was a big part of that championship run. Yeah, I don't think it's out of possibility that he just resigns a different contract to Rest- stay there. Just a little restructure, a little move. bit. If that's not the case, I was though, thinking, did, did he get word that somebody could pay him more or get a bigger deal? Well, he's he's in a LeBron he, column. He's in a weird spot, right? Because coming off of that the title year, he was a huge part of that title run. Mm-hmm. Made some big clutch shots in some different series. Since then, he's been hurt. And so we really haven't got we really haven't got to see Milwaukee defend their title yet. It, it was kind of akin to what happened in Denver. The bubble season happened. They made it to the Western Conference Finals. It felt like they were the team on the rise. Here they come, and then Jamal Murray gets hurt, and we don't see it until this year. And what happened? They won the title. It, it really feels to me like Milwaukee hadn't got a fair shake in being able to try to show what they can do. Right. And then how does this affect Giannis if he does leave? Does Giannis all of a sudden become available somehow, some way? And if he does, depending on what, I mean, what fortune, possibility-wise, because who else, who who has the ammo to get him in a trade? I can think of somebody. Who's that? The Oklahoma City Thunder. Really? It's, I mean, if if you're looking for young assets and draft picks for you know for Giannis, nobody's got more ammo in the tank than than the Thunder. In that regard, let me see how many, how many more years he just signed. What a year ago? Okay, so he, yeah, he's locked in 23, 24, 24, 25, and then has a player option in 25 and 26. So would he ride it out for two years and become a free agent in 25, 26? Maybe. But would you give up a boatload of picks and maybe Gideon Dort or something like that <laughs> for a year of Giannis? Uh, I would do that. On any day that ends in Y. <laughs> there you go. All right, speaking <laughs> of the Thunder, uh, tonight, over under 11 and a half, where they pick. They have the 12th pick, so over under is 11 and a half. Over is higher, under is lower. So if you think they're moving up, you pick under. If you think they're going to stay put, you pick, high, you pick over. Well, I'd stay over. I don't think they're moving up. I think they use the 12. How do you feel? You know, for a long time I thought under. But the teams ahead of them that you thought might want to move it, down. It seems like they're more in with the, some of the moves that were made. I don't know how many of those picks are going to be available now. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think, you know, Oklahoma City probably doesn't have the ammo to get all the way up to Portland at three. Is there somebody there they want anyhow? You know, but everybody else, it just kind of seems like, and about that time, bang, 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 something will happen. I actually think it's over, but I think it might not even be the 12th pick. I think it may be lower. I think it'll go down. Yeah. Should fans start mentally preparing themselves for Oklahoma City to draft somebody that you either haven't heard of if, or isn't if, going to make much of a difference next year. If you're a fan of the Oklahoma City Thunder and you are not already mentally prepared for that, <laughs> yeah, that's true too. <laughs> then you're not a fan of the Oklahoma City Thunder. You just jumped on board. I'm mentally prepared. You're, yeah. It would not shock me if he goes and drafts a guy and we go, who? We did it when he drafted Steve Adams. We did it when he drafted Giddy. And, and but it's it all shakes out. On the text line, please no more projects. I, I, There's a lot of me that agrees with that, but here's the problem. Why project could be headed. There's no roster spots. Yeah. Unless there's going to be some moves. There's just not a ton of roster spots available. And then with those boatload of first-rounders next year, I'm going to tell you, 
you might as well start preparing yourself for one name. Bilal Koulibaly. I've seen that come up more than Who is that guy? Yeah. He was Victor's teammate. Uh Uh-huh. Shooting guard slash small forward, things like 6'7". And stop me if you've heard this. Long wingspan, 18 years old, trouble shooting. (laughs) You know, exactly the opposite of what Thunder fans want to see because that's what they've always seen and it hasn't quite worked out just yet outside of one gangly dude from Texas that worked out just fine. I'm afraid that because here because they can put him in the G League and not have to worry about a spot for him. And the, and the, you've also got Usman Jang who I think is kind of the project this year too. For more, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. more of the developmental guy. Yeah, get ready for an Al Ashback. Bilal Kulabale, who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, harkening back to Bismack <laughs> Biombo from years past. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're going to have? You think they're going to draft somebody that can actually more more of the SG or um, SGA? You think they're going to draft somebody more of the J, Jalen Williams type that was older, ready to come in and compete on the NBA level right now, like they did last year, or the guy they put they took a, a pick ahead of him in Jang, who was clearly more of the project? I don't know because it's still a lottery pick. And it makes you, why would you draft and stash a guy when you have a lottery pick? So I'm kind of talking to myself and like you, maybe they'll maybe they'll trade down and do that, thinking we don't we can get this guy lower and, and pay him less, and we don't need all these assets. But if they stick with the twelve, I'd have to say they're going to draft a guy that could come in like a Williams and be uh, have an impact on this upcoming season. Who do you well, want that to be? I don't know. I really don't know. Outside of Wim and Jan, I mean, Scoot Henderson's way too high. Yeah, uh, I mean of the guys that are kind of around. Uh, I like maybe the teammate, maybe him. Um, yeah, see, he ain't helping this year. No. If you had I, your choice, if you had your choice of say, Derek Lively, he's Duke, big dude from big Duke. guy, yeah. Big guy, average five points, shot like 60% from the free throw line, like 14% from three. If you had a lot of people want Taylor Hendricks, UCF, he's been one of those guys that's jumped up the board lately. So, but so I kind of take him out. Grady Dick, I think, is going to be gone without moving up. So, you want Lively, you want the Kobe Bufkin. He's been a name that's been there from Michigan, kind of another point guard, shooting guard type guy. I'll tell you who I want. Who do you want? If we if we're wanting, I if, want a shooter. I'll just tell you that. I if, want we're, a if we're wanting somebody that can come in and help right this second next year, I think there's only one name: Jordan Hawkins, UConn. Dude that looks like Jay Z, long socks, can fill it up. If that's what you're wanting, immediate Jalen Williams type of guy, because he's 21. He's older, more developed. Now this may be as good as he gets. You know that's the that's the that's the secret on J on, on J Dub. Yeah, he was great this year, but he ought to have been. He's so much older than everybody yeah, else. Yeah. Uh, how much can he develop even higher? You know what, what's his ceiling? He's closer to it than a lot of the guys drafted around him. And so right now it's like, oh yeah, Jalen Williams, what a great draft pick. But in three years, if he's still the same, and so in those younger guys. Progress. That's why the NBA draft is so hard to figure out the projections on these guys in the middle. I'll take if if it has to be a guy that's helping now. Give me Jordan Hawkins from UConn. I would love it to be Grady Dick. I've wanted him from Kansas. Well, I mean, he I looks just, like a guy that can just can kind look, of be one of those guys that he's not going to be a star, but he's going to be a player that helps teams. Good teams win, I think. Yeah, I was high on him before the NCAA tournament. Right. Because I thought he might be a guy that could turn into that star, and, and they bowed out early. But if he did, and you probably could see him higher than that. Yeah. At least this <clears throat> this draft mock draft I'm seeing straight from NBA.com, 
Uh, he's right there at 11. I mean, imagine if that fell any further. But it has Oklahoma City taken lively. Yeah, see, this one has Kula Bali. I've seen Kobe Bufkin as well from Michigan. It all happened yeah, tonight. Bufkin. Yeah. It's in that area. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's still intrigue there. It's still a lottery pick. There's still some excitement with that, I oh, think. Yeah. Well, how much does it help the excitement at the 12 that last year's number 12 pick was Jalen Williams, right. who was the runner-up in the Rookie of the Year That's stuff? very true. Wrapping it up here on a Thursday with OK Kids so- State Softball Tournaments. Regional baseball tournaments all get going today. Jared will be in Clinton with the Canute Trojanettes. couple of brackets in the state tournaments for softball, so let's kind of run down through them right quick. Over at Clinton and 8U, blue bracket starting here in about an hour. Chickasha Bat Attitude versus Sentinel. That's at 11. The winner will play the Shawnee Hawks at 415. All these are double elimination, by the way. Weatherford Wildcats play the Moreland Lady Cats at 1245. The Blanchard Bombshells and the Merritt Storm at 230. Clinton Lady Reds and the Morris Aftershock at 6. Then some winners will play again tonight. Red Bracket, Thomas Wildflowers and the Hobart Freeze at 11. Winner plays Purcell Elite at 415. Jared's most interested game, Canute versus the Washington Warriors at 1245. Elgin Red and the Moreland Lady Cats 2K14 at 230. And Blanchard Diamonds, the Arapaho Butler Indians at six. What do you know about the uh, Washington Warriors? They're good. good. We look, you know, you can look up some stuff on Game Changer, and um, they got a great record: single digit losses, over thirty wins, I believe, maybe more. They play a lot of. Um, they played a lot of tournaments and won their league that they play in. So, it's a couple league champions going up against each other. Should be a lot of fun. Um, it's going to be a tough challenge for for our girls. But, I mean, this is why you get the state tournament. You want, I mean, these are all good teams. Should be a lot of fun. Washington's a good one. We're a good one. Moreland's a good one on our side. Um, Hobart's a good one. So, it should be fun. Okay, so just looking at this, it was, it was Hobart in this league? Hobart was in our league, yes. Okay, so Canute, Hobart, Sentinel, and Merritt? Merritt, yes. Okay, are the four league from, from, the, Elk, from the Elk City League? Yes. So, they did put two and two, and I think they're kind of even split. Yeah, they put the – just looking at our league, they put the uh, the champs, us, and the th- – yeah, the third – team that finished third in Hobart. Okay, and then two and four on the other two side. Two and four on the other side. Okay, that's eight U at Clinton. Ten U's at Weatherford. The blue brackets at 11 o'clock, Hobart – or Hobart. Hydro Weekly Bobcats and the Middleburg Tigers. Where's Middleburg? Any idea? Um, No. I never heard of that. Uh, anyway, they're at 11. Winner plays at Surreal at 415. Then Canute will play the Dibble Soul Sisters. What about the Soul Sisters? Any idea? It's a cool name. Uh, unlike uh, Washington, there's nothing on them on Game Changer. So can't really scout them out. Soul Sisters is S-O-L-E. Very good. Very good. It's very, I, I like listen, the name. That's very the good. names on the girls' side are so much cooler than the names on the boys' side. Uh, so that's 1245. Uh, the Dale Pride and the Cheyenne Spikes at 2.30 now. In this one, would that be a second-round game, Canute and Cheyenne? Yeah. I thought so. That I mean, was I just a semifinal game in the league tournament. Okay. Always so, fun when, when those two meet up. Yes. So that's a possibility later on this evening. And then Thomas Terriers and Morris Aces, that's 6 o'clock. Then over in the red bracket, uh, this one's just set. There's not an extra team here. Uh, Elk City Elkettes will start against the Okima Future. That one's coming up at 1245. The Chickasha Bat Attitude against the Cordell team at 230. Morrison Lady Cats, Burns Flats Dill City at 415. And then Moreland Lady Cats and Eagles Knicks. I assume that's a Weatherford team with Dustin Knicks uh, as the yeah, coach uh, yeah, yeah. at 6. I think you're right. Uh, so that's the 10U at Weatherford. And then the 12U State Softball Tournament over in Ada could have a Western Oklahoma semifinal or at least early semifinal of the bracket. you got Elmore City and Leedy, 1245. Elk City, Elkettes, and Fletcher at 230. I believe those te- the winners of that games will play. Cordell Lady Blue Devils will play Noble Bears at 415. And then the Preston All Clans against the Clinton Lady Reds. That's a 6 o'clock start down in Ada. Baseball. Man. By the way, I found Middleburg. We got to help. Where is Middleburg? Too. I looked on the maps. It's southwest of Blanchard. 
just off of what is that 62 huh well, I never, very, very small community. Never noticed that one in any of the times we've been down that way, Newcastle, Blanchard Way. I'm going to guess Middleburg is in the Blanchard School, school district, district, but the little town itself maybe had enough to play put a team together. Gotcha. A good enough team to get the state. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. All right, so then baseball is just in the regional round. Uh, softball doesn't – they go straight to state. And then you've got uh, baseball is regional. So El- Elk City, for the first time that I can remember – is hosting some regionals out here at the Fiveplex, which is a good thing for sure. Absolutely. In the 8U, which is coach pitch, you've got Thomas and Navajo at 5. The winner will play the Elk City Smash at 8 o'clock. Rappo Butler Indians, Altus Drillers at 3.30. Elk City Bombers are the first game of the day against the Lakiba Sickles. That's at 2. At Perry, an 8U tournament, uh, Laverne is there. They'll play Perkins at 5, and if they win, get the Perry Maroons at 8. Uh, the Woodward Dingers are up there against Morrison at 3.30. Then down at Fletcher, the Burns Flat Red is kind of waiting on a game. Whoever wins between Chickasha Cardinals and the Anadarko Warriors play Burns Flat Red. And then Chickasha Impact will play Hollis at 5. The winner plays Fletcher at 8. What, you got a weird look on your face. Oh, no, we're good. Oh, okay. Uh, then 10U at Weatherford. This is baseball regionals. It says Wednesday, so these games may have happened yesterday. I just noticed that a little bit ago. Kingfisher Yellow Jackets played Canute. Do you know if that happened? 10U baseball? Uh, yeah, I believe Kingfisher won. Kingfisher won. So Kingfisher would have played Weatherford last night. You had Arapahoe Indians against Clinton Maroon at 245, and then Darko and Weatherford Wildcats was at 430. There wasn't any updated results there, unfortunately. Then today, 10U right here in Elk City. Got six teams in this one. Altus Drillers and Hobart Hitman get going at 245. The winner plays Visai at 615. Navajo and Apache go at it at 430. The winner plays one of my favorite mascots, the Elk City Fire Frogs. That's at eight. I love the Fire Frogs. I do too. I love them. Then 12U at Weatherford. There's actually two different regionals at Weatherford. One of these was supposed to be at Ada. But when you hear the names, you can figure out why it's at Weatherford. The first one originally scheduled for Weatherford is Woodward Sluggers and Cheyenne Raiden Bears at 5, Okarchi and the Weatherford Bulldogs at 7. Then the one that was originally at Ada, now back at Weatherford, Chickasha and Hobart at 5, the Alva Renegades and the Elk City Crushers will play at 7. So what you've got there is it's not one eight-team regional, it's two four-team regionals which means out of those eight teams, half of them, four of the eight, will go on to the state tournament next week at Salisaw. So that's kind of how that's going to work. It's just a change of venue, I guess. Once they got – once they figured out who they had, which I'll be honest with you, Jared, that works for me. Why's that? To just have to go to Weatherford and not stay here while everybody else goes to Ada. Yeah. It works out for me a lot better, that thing being at Weatherford. It's going to be fun. Next couple of days, we'll name you know state champs by what, Saturday? Is Saturday the last of the softball? Yeah. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, and then, of course, the we'll know a lot of these regionals by Friday night. One of the teams will be decided that's going to state because these regionals, you get two. And so if, you're, if you win two games, essentially – on, on a bunch of these, if you win two, you're there. And then you just await opponent and see if you are a regional champ or go in as the other way, which will it, it affects you by way of the bracket, you know, kind of where you're at because they've got it slotted for a regional winner on one side and a regional runner-up on the other for all these different deals. But it's going to be a lot of fun, a whole bunch of fun. Looking forward to it. It ought to be an absolute blast. Final prediction, Jared. Who do the Thunder take tonight? A no name. A no name. <laughs> Someone we that's not on, not on anybody's radar. Who do you got? But I hope he's a shooter. Um, somebody that I haven't even seen. Okay, how about this one? I have not seen this guy in the Thunder in any mock draft. How about Kaysen Wallace? Kentucky. I can't go wrong there, I guess. Doesn't feel like about it's every like, good player in the NBA that's not European or that's non-American. Yeah. Don't you feel like Kentucky? 
Yeah. How about that? Cason Wallace, Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. What is this? From the Scott, Scott from the tax line. Oh, I, yeah. Yep. I'm afraid who the hell is that's going to be the answer. Everybody have a great Thursday. You've been listening to the Skinny on Sports podcast with Aaron Cow. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get alerts of when the latest podcast is available. Thanks for listening.